So good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to the fifth webinar of the Valley Test webinar series on the concept of test validation in plant health. So today we will discuss uh, why communication on test selection between risk managers and diagnostic laboratories are important. So this is actually the last webinar of uh, the series on the concept of test validation in plant health. Uh, there will be then another valid test webinar series on, on TPS organization. Uh, so the presentation will be recorded and uh, a link to the recording and the PDF of the presentation will be uh, provided on the valid test website uh, later on. So today uh, we have two speakers with us. So the first speaker is Françoise Peter, uh, who is um, in charge at EPO of uh, the program on diagnostics. And uh, she is also uh, the chairman of EPO panels, on six EPO panels. So uh, yeah, and our second uh, speaker is Barbara Ag is Barbara Axtoner from FERA. So Barbara is a social economist um, with a research interest in environmental and behavioral economics. Uh, she's started to work for FERA in 2015 and uh, she's involved in several projects on economics and social aspects of the detection and control of uh, plant pests and diseases. So with no further ado, um, I will uh, give the floor to uh, Françoise and uh, to Baba. Thank you, Charlotte, uh, for the introduction. So um, today uh, we, we, we will present uh, the topic of communication between risk managers and diagnostic laboratories and why this is important. And um, so I will first give the floor to Barbara to give uh, the outline. Oh, first, no, first, the first poll <laughs> that we, we, need to, we need to organize. So we want to know who is present today and uh, who are you? So are you a risk manager, a diagnostician or other? So have people uh, told us who Sorry, they are? Yes, about 90% of the people have voted. So I guess I will close the poll and share the results. So I'm trying to look at the results. Okay, so uh, we have 11% uh, of risk managers, 64% of diagnostician and 25% of people who consider them neither risk manager nor diagnostician. Um, okay, so um, Barbara, just uh, a little bit of outline. Yes, um, so thank you both uh, for that and hello and welcome everyone to the webinar today. Um, so to see who is who is here and I think we'll have various polls throughout the uh, the presentation um, for one so that we can make the most of everyone who is here and also so there is a little bit of an exchange between um, between ourselves in this virtual world. So Francoise will start us off with uh, talking about the um, communication recommendations from uh, the European Mediterranean Plant Health Organization. And uh, I will then go and describe a little bit um, a framework that we try to design um, or are designing currently within Valitest to, um, to look at uh, well, um, basically the, test, the whole testing program from sort of sim taking an example to the whole concept 
minutes at the end. Um, and then I will speak a little bit about what we found when we talked to risk managers and diagnosticians about what is actually happening um, communication wise at the moment. Okay, so it seems that there is a problem that you people don't see my screen. Yes, I, I don't know. I'm still on the poll, uh, Francoise. So I just would like to make sure that you are screening the, the, the screen. Uh, maybe we should ask some people to put uh, in the chat if they see the screen or not, because uh, I haven't changed anything. Can uh, someone write in the chat can whether you can see the, the presentation or not? I, I can no, also. They cannot see. Poll, they say they cannot see. They cannot That's see. The poll. Okay. So just to can you, maybe can you stop I, sharing and, and okay. reshare. Uh, show poll result to all attendees. Okay, I'll do that. Uh, okay. Thank you uh, to everyone for answering. We can see that. Yeah, so now it should work. Okay. okay. I can see the presentation. Okay. Okay. So maybe after each poll, I have to do that. Um, Usually you don't have to do it, but uh, yeah. okay. Anyway, so let's start with uh, with the presentation. So uh, today uh, the first part, as Barbara said, is about what EPO recommends in terms of uh, communication, and I must say that it 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 was not there from the very beginning. So this is a, a change that was made uh, in 2018. So relatively um, uh, not not that far ago. So those who have attended previous webinar will say she's always saying the same, but I think it's important for those who were not there to, to repeat that the risk managers, they are organizing surveillance, import inspection, export inspection, uh, certification of plant propagating material, and all these activities that are conducted by NPPOs involve testing. So testing is really crucial. Testing needs to be often quick, but very accurate. That's what is essential. So you need quick and accurate diagnostics. And of course, this is of uh, at most important because if you have a positive result, this may result in phytosanitary action being taken by the NPPO. And then this is where you can have significant uh, financial, but also social and environmental consequences. So the examples that are given here, one from our region, another one from uh, further away, is uh, an eradication in uh, orchards, the one for Xylella fastidiosa and the other one for um, uh, Wang Long Bing. So this is really important. That's what you do when you do so that what can happen when you have a positive result in the framework of your surveillance, but it's the same for import and export inspection. You could reject consignment at import, but also uh, deny export to consignment because of a positive result. And of course, all these activities from uh, uh, that that we uh, are conducted at the level of NPPO are done in different circumstances and then the tests that are used are de facto used in different circumstances. So you could be there, there could be testing done because, because of um, surveillance, routine, routine surveys that are conducted for pests that are present in the country. You could also have surveillance done to establish a pest-free area, for example. Uh, you are testing uh, plants with symptoms, but you may also be testing plants without symptoms, so just latent infections. Uh, testing is often part of eradication um, programs, and this is exactly what was shown in the previous slides. Uh, testing is also associated with export, so phytosanitary certification, but also with certification schemes for plants for planting. And of course, testing is regularly done when uh, consignments are imported. So they, can, they are um, test done in 
uh, different type of commodities when they are imported. So we also want to be able to detect a first incursion of a pest in an area. So detection of a pest in an area where it's not known to occur. And also uh, detection of pests in consignment where the country says we don't have this pest. And so these different circumstances which are reflected in uh, the EPO standards, but also in the IPPC standard on diagnostic, uh, they are different. And depending on that, you may need different test characteristics. So this is the context. So now we come to our second poll. So do you discuss the choice of, the te of tests to be performed with the laboratory and PPO? So So this is a second poll, so please vote. <clears throat> so do you have this type of discussions? Is this so yeah, about almost 80% of the people have answered. Maybe we, we so, should try to aim at 90 as we did for the, we had 90 on the first uh, poll. Yeah, but it's not changing anymore. So it's not changing anymore. So I will close okay. the poll. So I don't dare to open to see the results. So Charlotte, if you could tell the results so that I can have an idea. Yeah. So I close the poll and I share the results. So 54% uh, of the people answered yes, 25% no, and 21% were not uh, concerned by the question. OK. Well, uh, that's a pretty good figure, 54, Barbara. You must be delighted to see that figure. So uh, thank you for uh, answering the question. Uh, so. Oops. So in fact, uh, because we think this is really important, this discussion, we, as I explained at the start, decided to have now a specific section in our generic standard, PM776, on the use of EPO diagnostic standards. And here in that, uh, in that standard, we have a really a, a section dedicated to that communication, which in fact we call the communication with the customers because um, NPPOs are one of the customers of laboratories. So the first thing uh, that you discuss is, is um, the sample. So I'm, I'm not going that much into the detail, but uh, it's just important for the customer to be really well aware that the result of the, of the test depends on the sample you get. So you need to get samples um, of good quality, and, and so that's the first thing. So what type of sample should I get in my lab, and can we agree on, on a sampling regime? And uh, our standard refers to the ISPM 31 on, uh, on, uh, on sampling, and also to some uh, standards where we give a little bit more detail about uh, how to do the sampling and what the sampling could be, the sample could be, and also in some of the specific diagnostic standard in, in specific diagnostic standard we also provide detail on on the sample size um, but it is also very important that between the lab and the NPPO there is information provided so mainly to the risk manager to help them to make an informed decision so to choose the best test depending on what their needs are and so this is where the communication should happen in advance to determine the tests that are appropriate for the circumstances of use. And also communication with the risk managers on the level of uncertainty of a test result. So do you run the risk with that test to have more false positive, more false negative? And which one do you want to choose and which, which one will be best adapted to uh, why you need to test? So that's uh, really important. 
And so some examples of uh, elements that are taken into account and where the risk manager really need to discuss with the, the, the diagnosticians is that maybe in some in a lab you may want to have the best uh, the the most sense the the test with the best analytical sensitivity, but then maybe uh, this is an a, a test that will be very costly. So you you really need to have this discussion for routine diagnostic or diagnosis or surveillance. Maybe you want some a test that is quick and that is not that expensive. And that would be for the NPPO more critical to have more tests performed than having a test that costs a lot with a very high analytical sensitivity or specificity. So this is where we think the discussion between the lab and the risk managers are important. When you are, your objective is to detect a pest where it's not known to occur, then you will discuss with your risk manager and, and tell, well, a high level of analytical sensitivity, specificity, repeatability and reproducibility may be required. So this is why the risk manager comes with some constraints. You come with your knowledge about the test and you discuss so that you make the best choice. And so Another element also is that uh, if you are importing a test, uh, a pest, uh, sorry, not a pest, a, a plants for planting, for example, in an area which is pest free, another element is that the, the risk manager will, the, the, the risk manager will probably ask you, okay, um, in this case, um, can I take phytosanitary action without the final confirmation of the identity? Because I don't want to run the risk and have the consequences of introducing the pest. So in this case, what you will discuss with the risk manager is the risk of have, having a false positive result against having a false negative result in the confirmation test. So this is the type of, of examples that uh, requires clearly discussion between the labs and the risk managers. So basically, uh, there are different ways of establishing it, but um, we know that in uh, in some NPPOs they have multi 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 I, I won't get it multi disciplinary uh, advice teams. And, uh, and here they, they have a group composed of laboratory people, inspectors, and also risk managers to have this type of discussion and help making an informed decision. So um, this is a little bit out, uh, a little bit at the margin of our discussion, but uh, I just want to draw your attention to other elements that are in uh, this standard on, uh, on um, PM 776 uh, and about the communication about the test result. So it's also clear, it's also important that there is this discussion to understand better what is an inconclusive result. But there is also another element which is very important, which is the question about the viability of the pest, because we know that uh, indirect tests for uh, are, are are not able to distinguish between dead and live. And again, there is a need for a discussion to measure the risk of letting a consignment come in with viable pests or refusing on consignment with only non-viable pests. So these are the type of points that are discussed in the in this presented in this standard and and this is the theoretical part of it. And uh, now we will go to the practical part of it with Farah. So Barbara Rose is yours. So I'm Thank now you. um Sorry, I will give you the, if I'm able to. I'll, okay, so. I'll get control over Gosh. the. Uh... Yes, I need to give you the control, <laughs> but then, uh, so I'm, I'm just, I, I lo lost, I'm sorry for the audience. Um, 
So now I lost what I had before we started. So, okay, now got it. Okay. You should have it now. It's not doing anything yet, but hopefully in a second, it might just take um, a little bit of time. Ah, there we go. Um, so I will start with the framework. Um, as I mentioned, um, and part of what we were, as Francois mentioned, what we are interested in is to what extent really is um, are the recommendations that Francois has um, described already implemented in the processes at the moment. So um, we, oh, it's not wanting to do what I want. Okay, so we started with uh, looking at an idealized uh, situation of. Um, so we have all the different actors and their responsibilities. So we've got the risk managers who generally will hold the budget, who will link in with European and other legislation, who will have access to pest impact assessments and um, do priority setting. Um, then we've got the laboratories uh, who do the test development and the testing itself. And we've got the inspectorate who will do the visual testing, uh, the physical sampling, and uh, uh, action any response that needs to be actioned. Um, so, and for us then, all these three extra groups are important to design the sampling program and the testing program. So why do we talk about a program? So um, I'll just briefly describe this framework that um, we are developing within uh, Valitest uh, in our work package. Um, don't be too concerned about the detail of this graph. It's just a nice way to illustrate um, the whole process from taking this initial sample all the way through doing various tests to the um, result and then the consequence of the result. So um, I, I'll well, let me start by just briefly trying to describe um, what this this graph is saying. So we could, for example, have the um, inspector looking at or for symptomatic plants so in a way that is a first test it's a visual assessment um, there will then be symptomatic plants that the inspector thinks are potentially infected um, he can then test those the positive ones so we're going down the left hand side of the diagram with a diagnostic test so for instance an infield lfd um, test um, and then again he could decide to send the positive samples to the laboratory for confirmation so um, there is this chain of tests and events. And of course, every individual or the characteristics of every individual test are very important. But in on the whole, we are interested in the aggregate. So we're interested in the costs across all of these tests, as well as the false positives and the false negatives, which are obviously dependent on the characteristics of the tests, but across the whole program so that we um, can then this uh, or can then um, calculate the cost of the whole program as well as um, the uh, false positives um, and the false negatives and the um, sort of the um, ah, I'm losing words um, the probability of those and then obviously the the consequence of what does that mean for on the ground for impact so um, this one is just an example is basically where we don't perform any tests then of course we don't have any testing costs um, but also we don't and we don't have any false positives but basically the whole prevalence will be false negatives so there will be a consequence on the ground either um, destroyed crops or destroyed trees or um, whatever the pest is affecting so then um, just quickly looking at a second example so this is what I already started to describe is we can have, for instance, an inspector doing a visual assessment at the first instance, taking um, um, symptomatic plants and performing an LFD test on that. And if that comes back positive, sending it to the laboratory and then testing it again there. And again, the costs are then of the first inspection, the LFD and including lab test. And we can also then aggregate the um, program false negatives across the whole program and false positives across the whole program and uh, therefore link it to the actual consequences and the potential consequences of that testing program. So I'm not going to go into any more detail here um, because we're still playing with it, but just to say 
that there are various things that we are exploring within within that framework, which are um, we're kind of looking at it two ways. So either um, if you take a test or a testing program that you have right now, then we can look at what are the consequences for the costs, what are the consequences for the expected prevalence and so expected damage, and also flipping it around, like uh, if we would optimize a program. Um, what would be the optimal number of steps? What would be the optimal number of tests per step? Um, and also uh, another question that we are interested in is what actually, um, in a way, what, what value has validation um, in that it um, we are looking at, well, if we have validation and those characteristics of the test change, what actual consequence does that have on the program costs and on the expected damage? So there's various things that we're exploring here and um, which will be presented at the final um, valid test meeting and also obviously any, any of the outputs of the, um, our work package, work package for within valid test um, will highlight that. So we've heard a lot about um, sort of why we think that communication is important to get these things right. So just a, a quick question or poll question here is um, actually it's part of three poll questions. So if we have various scenarios, and in this case, in the first case, it's uh, early detection of a high risk pathogen, then um, what tests would you consider using for the initial survey? So here we're not talking about a confirmatory test, but the initial survey. So would you go for a high cost test, which is um, very sensitive? So we've got a diagnostic sensitivity of over 95%, or would you be okay with having a diagnostic sensitivity lower, so maybe under 85%, but which costs half, um, none of those, or would you consider both of those? Just thank you. So it might take a bit longer because people have to think about the questions. So for now, 55 of the people have answered. So I will wait a bit longer. A bit longer. It's still increasing. Seventy-five percent. Okay, we are at 76 percent. It's not changing so much anymore. So okay, I no guess I will close the poll now. Mm -hmm. Okay, and share the results. Okay. That's interesting. Okay. So we have um, the majority, so over 50%, 56% um, would consider mainly the high cost test, which uh, has a superior specificity, ah, sorry, sensitivity, I keep mixing those up. 25% um, would go with the um, less sensitive but cheaper test. 6% um, would go with none, which is interesting. <laughs> Could follow up on that. Um, and 13% would consider both. And I guess that highlights a little bit what we will be talking about um, in the next couple of slides. But maybe before we go there, I think we have two more questions, which basically are the same question, but for a different scenario. So we have um, the same the same answer. So would you go for a really high sensitive test, which is also costly, or a lower sensitive test, which is less costly, um, but this time for mapping the current distribution of a pest? So, um, ah, thank you very much. So it's going a bit quicker. We had 76% of the people that have voted. It's still increasing, so I will wait a bit longer. Oh, 
Okay, so now we have uh, 81, 82%. It's not changing so much, so I will close the poll. Awesome. Thank and you. share the results. Okay, interesting. Okay, so now we have the, for mapping current distribution, um, the high cost test is considered by a smaller percentage, so only 25%, whereas um, a lot would, 64% would go with uh, the less sensitive but cheaper test and 10% still for both or would consider both probably depending a little bit more information on on the context okay and then we just have a quick last um scenario which is the uh eradication of freedom from testing and again the same same choices for the So we reach 75%. I will wait a bit longer. So yes, 78% of the people have answered and it's not changing so much. So I will close the poll and share the results. Okay. All right, and then um, we have the sensitive test again winning out with the uh, 68% over only 11% this time would choose a uh, less sensitive test but less costly test um, and 17% would consider both. Okay, thank you very much. That is really interesting. Um, so if we go now to um, our case study, I just I should highlight that it's currently still quite heavily influenced, I guess, by the uh, UK case study, just because we have direct access to um, to risk managers and laboratories here. Um, but we would we are still um, continuing to sort of talk to various risk managers laboratories also across um, other countries. So you know, if if you would like to. Um, or show your experiences, um, you're very welcome and I will ask at the end as well again. Um, so what we found so far is um, that the risk managers um, are heavily concentrating on contingency plans, which will of course um, include suggestions on sampling and on testing and also take into account um, the, the sampling uh, that is done as well as the test choices that there are. But it, it is very much, um, or it's, it's a little bit more subtle than uh, an actual discussion. Uh, and also, uh, it seems that um, a lot of the budgets are outsourced. So for instance, laboratories hold testing budgets, um, inspectorates hold sampling budgets. So there is less need to communicate on those um, and also on the prioritization. And between the lab and the inspectorate, um, what tends to be the communication is mainly, well, the inspectorate, as you would expect, send the samples, get the test results, generally want a yes, no answer. Um, so the actual programs are not so much or don't seem to be so much designed in communication. Of course, there is communication across um, the different actor groups. Um, but one thing that we have heard on test selection a lot is that the lab knows best um, from risk managers about you know which, which tests to use, which not disputing that that is true, um, but also validation packs that are produced by the laboratories are rarely shared with the um, risk managers. So um, the actual detail of the test characteristics are rarely shared, um, or maybe just talked in, a, in a, on higher sort of um, a bit more abstract terms, let's say. Um, ah, I forgot that we have <laughs> another poll, sorry. Um, so if we ask you which sensitivity specificity metrics you consider during test selection, um, is it analytical or is it diagnostic or is it 
both of those. Um, I'll just have that quick question in before because um, we will talk about this in the next slide. So about 60% have answered. I will wait a bit longer. Still increasing. Yes, so now we have reached 78% of the people that have voted and it's not changing so much anymore. So I will close the poll mm -hmm. and share the results. Okay, right, that's interesting. So we have 20% each sort of mainly talking about either just analytical or just diagnostic um, or taking it into account rather in the test selection and the majority taking into account both, which is what we like to hear. Um, so if we go then here. So um, one thing that we found, um, again, we, we have spoken to quite a few risk managers, but also um, laboratory staff. So if we ask when sensitivity is important, and that kind of links back to the polls that we've, we've asked here as well, um, what we tend to hear from risk managers is that it's very important for early detection. So it's a scenario-based approach. Um, it, that links in with the, um, the EPO guidance of the different scenarios that we can have um, testing for. Um, often also there is discussions around the consequences of false positives, false negatives, um, because of, of course that is linked to the impact directly on the ground. Sometimes even it um, included when we sort of drilled down into, you know, ask questions of what do you actually mean, it even included some uh, details on the sampling strategy, so which then kind of gets into a bit mixed into with the sensitivity um, and the importance of sensitivity. Whereas when we talk to laboratories, um, the focus is very much on the um, physical um, needs for a test. So for instance, if there is not much DNA in a sample, if it's a screening test, um, then sensitivity becomes more important. So um, that means the focus in, is on analytical sensitivity. It's obviously very much based on the pest and general biology. Um, and in a way, it implicitly um, uses visual inspection as a first test. If we get symptomatic tests and assume uh, symptomatic samples and assume that there is already a higher amount of DNA in that sample, and then sensitivity becomes a little bit less important. So, um, of course, both of these are very valid and very important for the general decision of a test, but it's just highlighting that actually it might be. Um, different stakeholders might be talking about the same thing, but before a different context. And it's important to understand where the, the other party is coming from here. Um, similarly, with test speed, when we talk to risk managers, speed is, again, it's scenario based, it's important for perishable goods. If we have um, things being imported that really need to get to the end destination quickly, um, you know, herbs, anything that kind of goes off quickly, um, whereas in the laboratory, it tends to be more, again, and of course, because that's that's what happens at the laboratory is the, the actual physical testing, but it's more based on the organism behavior. So for instance, if a organism is particularly slow growing, it might be that um, a PCR is, is um, take or it will be considered before uh, other forms of test. So it's, of course, these, again, they are linked, and they're both important, but it's um, these two stakeholder groups coming at it from a slightly different angle and not necessarily always discussing these in a lot of detail. So it might be that we then have um, sort of, you know, our own understanding for interpreting what the other uh, party says. So uh, what we found uh, up to now which again, uh, we are still keen to talk to loads of different individuals. And that's why the, the polls today are also really important and really informative for us as well. Um, but of course, time as always is a barrier for communication. 
as well as complexity. I mean, we have there's so many different tests, there's so many different scenarios, there is um, so many different tests. So, um, and that's that's part of why we are trying to formalize it with this framework to have to be able to look at different scenarios um, and testing programs in those scenarios and what or what role the sensitivities, specificities, and individual test characteristics play in that bigger framework so that we can potentially have also um, a communication, a, a basis for communication. There's of course, um, every individual has a, a specific background, which will inform how they think about things, how they talk about things. Uh, some things might uh, just be language. So um, as we saw, the labs are very much focusing on analytical um, sensitivity specificity, even though um, the the poll results show that very much aware of the, the importance of both of those, whereas maybe a risk manager might be coming more from a diagnostic sensitivity specificity angle. Um, it's just being aware of the danger of if we just say sensitivity specificity, it might be that we're talking about a slightly different thing. And of course, again, they are linked, but um, it's this being clear what we're talking about and what the ultimate aim is that we are trying to, to reach. Um, that's that's kind of already gone into into the interpretation as well. So again, um, Apple guidance is we we want to validate a test for a specific um, scenario. So the question is just what do we mean by scenario? So is it as risk managers usually go with early detection, mapping, um, freedom from, or is it um, based on biology? Do we have a lot of DNA in a sample, do we have less DNA in a sample? Again, both really important, but it's just being aware of um, the, the, the background that someone might be coming from. Okay, and that is just, that might be a little bit left field, but of course this, the whole project valid test is about validation. So we just have a final question on um, what do you think a validated test is? And um, again, linked to the sensitivity and specificity questions. So um, I don't. I think I'll let you read that uh, for yourself in peace and just launching the last poll for today. So I will launch the poll. I just people uh, read the the possible answers on on the slide because on, on the poll they are a bit uh, shorter. So the first answer is a test for which the analytical sensitivity and analytical specificity are known and defined by, by a large number of replicates. The second is uh, a test for which the analytical sensitivity, analytical specificity, diagnostic sensitivity and diagnostic specificity are known and defined by a large number of replicates. And the last one is a test which has been shown to perform well for its intended use. So you can now vote. Thank you, Charles. Sorry, I, I was trying to get around saying sensitivity and specificity a lot because it's difficult. <laughs> and now we have about 65% of the people that have voted. I will wait a bit longer, it's still increasing. So now we are at 70 and it's not changing so much. So a okay. bit less people are answering this question, but I guess I will close the poll and share the results. We have 15% who are mainly looking at the, the analytical sensitivity specificities got the majority, so 53%. Um, taking into account all of it for a uh, validated test and 32% um, say a test which performs well for its intended use. Um, and that's interesting, it's again, it's this what is actually intended use and, and what do people understand on the intended use. So thank you very much, that was really interesting. So um, I think, oops, what am I doing? Um, So as I mentioned at the very 
beginning of this section, so far this is quite heavily influenced by um, the people we have kind of easy access to, which doesn't mean which, well, it would just be interesting for us to understand a little bit more widely um, what, what the situation is like uh, for different risk manager groups, different laboratories. Um, so we have a um, individual exercise that we have asked um, people to fill in and we've uh, not had that much response. So if there's anyone who would feel like um, just having a look through, it's it's quite short. It's basically um, revolving around those three scenarios that we've asked about in the beginning and just looking at which test characteristics are most important or which you consider most important in those various scenarios. Um, of course, there is no right or wrong. What we are trying to understand is what, what happens and how we can help hopefully with the framework to um, create something that um, can be used as a basis for discussion. Um, so we can take all these different scenarios into account that Francois has mentioned and described and sort of make it a little bit easier to communicate um, about those things within test selection. So I think in the satisfaction survey, you might be able to, or you should hopefully be able to let us know whether you'd be interested in just having a little go at uh, at our exercise, or you can also just, you know, if you want to have a chat in person, also very welcome. Um, so yeah, I think that is it. Thank you very much. And um, open to questions, I guess. So yes, we are right on time. So uh, if you have a question for Barbara or Françoise, you can uh, put your question in the chat or you can also uh, raise your hand and we can give you the floor. Uh, I guess that we accept uh, questions, but also, I mean, reaction or if you want yes, to share your okay. experience, uh, you can you can go ahead. So we had uh, one first question, uh, which is um, regarding the evaluation of the uh, of pr the program of performance and cost. Uh, Barbara, you mentioned the final result will be presented in the final valid test meeting. So the question is: Is it uh, possible to know when this is foreseen in time? Uh, yes, but I forgot when our last meeting is. <laughs> I think it's um i yeah. think it will be in june yeah, yeah. Uh, so anyone so I, who as well though feel free to get in touch and we it will all be um available on through the final dissemination um report valid test i guess we do have it on a valid test website don't we but yeah feel free to get in touch um if you're interested in, in that. So they, there is a question. Do you consider inspectorate time as part of the cost? <laughs> uh, yes, so it's it's dependent, of course, on the scenario that we look at, but we have looked them, especially when sampling is kind of considered a first or visual inspection is a first test, then we do take uh, that into account as well. So it depends a little bit on what we want to look at, and that's why the framework is so nice because we can have the various different steps and can define the, in, the inspector as a first selection test, um, but it's definitely taken into account. What is currently not taken into account is time in terms of um, how long it takes, takes to get the test results. So as Francois mentioned, that is also can be really important. So that needs to be still, we still need to think of how we can take that into account as well. So for, so for, for the date, uh, uh, sorry, Charlotte, I just I was just checking the dates. So the the last the week of the seventh of June, this is where we will have uh, some the final events of Valley Test. So uh, watch out on the website, and uh, as soon as we have more detail, this will be um, made available uh, on the website. And I think, Charlotte, we can also use the uh, addresses of people who participated in the different uh, seminars to make them aware. Yeah. So we have two more questions. So the first one, 
uh, how to deal with the protection of data from private customers when we detect a quarantine organism. Uh, they avoid to send samples because they are afraid of a positive detection with all the consequences. Which is your opinion? Uh -huh. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I, I th that that is actually something that I think. Um, it, Maria and Lynn, um, yes. so people are looking at in within the Zalela project because, of course, for Zalela it was specifically. Uh, important because you can close down your whole business um so there is there is yeah there's definitely an incentive problem or might be an incentive problem there for people to just not communicate something um i yeah i'm not entirely sure what exactly the question is um it's it's difficult <laughs> and um i will um I haven't I haven't actually looked into what what the um preliminary results are for this Salala um working group, which um would not be interesting to know. So another uh, question we have I think on the question of confidentiality, so we have uh, information in our standards. Um, the lab, the, the, there is, a, um, what is important is that you are not recognizing uh, from the outside where the company is, etc. But as soon as there is a positive result from a quarantine test, then they are, um, they, then there is a notification obligation to the NPPO. And this needs to, make, to be made very clear to the customer. So I don't know, uh, Maria, uh, I think that was your question. But um, uh, the, the confidentiality, uh, the, the fact that the samples should be anonymous for in terms of quality assurance, but if you have a positive result, then uh, it's the, the NPPO should be, should be made aware. So there is a question, um, a sample infected with a dead organism is positive or negative? Uh -huh. <laughs> that's, uh, that's, uh, that's typically where there is an, a need for a lot of discussion between uh, the risk manager and, and, uh, and the diagnostician. Uh, we dream of a test that will be able to simply distinguish uh, life and dead. But unfortunately, we are not there now. And we know that some of the tests, I mean, the experience with some of the tests that are able to uh, tell you if the organism is alive or dead, <clears throat> do not have um, a level of sensitivity, which uh, the panel on diagnostic uh, that operate in Apple consider that they can have sufficient confident, confidence in this test. So for example, bioassay or so, this is a tricky question, and uh, it's, it, it has to be a case by case because, unfortunately, we don't have the miracle solution on that yet. So there I'm is sorry, an we can, yeah. There is an example that is uh, given in the chat, which is a pallet bearing dead pine wood nematodes, mm -hmm. which would be considered negative mm -hmm. because it means that they have been heat treated mm -hmm. and that the well, it, treatment yeah. worked. Exactly. But that's that's what that's what uh, you need to consider is has there been a treatment? So you have to get as much information on, for example, the consignment in this case uh, to to make a decision between the risk managers and and the lab. Uh, and there is a comment: the time of death could be very important. So it's a uh, yeah. The person says it's really a case by case. Yeah, it's a case by case. Yeah. Uh, so we have a question: Why the NRLs don't have access um, to the name of variety or uh, location? I think of sampling. Why the samples must be completely blind? It's 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 an accreditation quality assurance requirement. So the person doing the analysis in the lab 
should not be able to link the sample to a specific grower. It's to prevent, it's to ensure confidentiality. That doesn't mean that someone else and the person doing the lab sample doing the analysis cannot have access to the information but it's to prevent conflict of interest so all the the requirement that exists in uh, in quality assurance and accreditation we did not invent that because to be honest with you at import it can be quite important to know for example where the consignment comes from because it's really it can really help you in uh, in doing your analysis like excluding some uh, so there, there is some information available, but not always. So I don't see any other question nor uh, hand raised. So um, I would like to thank uh, Barbara and Francoise uh, for making this uh, presentation today. Uh, thank you all for attending the webinar. Uh, there is, is a satisfactory survey that will be launched at the end of the webinar. Uh, it will also be uh, transmitted by email in the follow-up email of the webinar. So it is really short, so do not hesitate to provide us uh, feedback and this helps us to improve uh, the webinar experience. And there is also a question uh, regarding what Barbara just mentioned, uh, if you want to contribute to the work of WP4 and help them uh, better understand how decisions are made. And you can uh, answer that you agree and, and then uh, Barbara will contact you. Uh, as I said, the presentation was recorded and there will be a link to the recording on the website. And so it was the last webinar of our uh, series on the concept of validation. Uh, there is one more activity um, that has been postponed to the end of April regarding the use of kits. Um, you can still register for this activity, just know that if you register now, you won't be able uh, to perform the test of the kits. And, uh, and uh, of course, uh, on Friday, there is a new series that will start on uh, TPS organization and you are welcome to register if it is of interest for you. So thank you very much to everybody and I wish you a nice afternoon. See you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Charlotte?